Hello and welcome to Behind the Screen. I am JM. This is the Iconic Production Channel and today we're talking about books that inspire me as a game designer, as a role player, as a GM, as a world builder. So someone asked me like where do you get your creativity from as a writer? Um, I recently did a couple of classes uh, where I spoke to high schools uh, back in Colorado Springs about creative writing. It was definitely one of the first questions that I get asked all the time. Where do you get your inspiration from? And for me, for all of this, the more you read, the easier it is to write. That's just my, my personal opinion. And you need to write, read broadly, not just fiction, but like nonfiction, classics, new things. Um, yeah, the more, the more you create, the more you read, the easier it is to create. Like we talked about last week on Thursday, Tolkien lifted, uh, a lot of the names from the Hobbit right out of the poetic eddas. If you go back and read history of middle earths, which are sort of these big, uh, black volumes up here, the earliest versions of what would become the Silmarillion were very similar to the Kalevala, the Finnish national epic. And so I, that's kind of where we're going to start. You know, Tolkien for me for fantasy is so foundational and inspirational to the fantasy fantasy genre as we know it that it is worth reading. Um, there's this list called the Appendix N, which is the books that inspired Gary to create Dungeons and Dragons, or at least heavily influenced him. Uh, you can see kind of down here is some of the Thieves World stuff. I've got. Uh, on the shelf, uh, you know, uh, Three Hearts, Three Lions. I've got some Lord Dunsany here, uh, which if you've not read Lord Dunsany, let's start here. Tolkien kind of goes without saying. Thieves World is a, is a massive uh, multi-volume mosaic novel with a ton of great authors, each writing stories in one city. But let's go back to even before Tolkien. There's Lord Dunsany. Uh, Lord Dunsany wrote what we would call fantasy today, but he was writing just imaginative literature at the time that he was doing this. There are just some amazingly strange ideas in Lord Dunsany. And uh, Penguin Classics has this book. It's 16 bucks. You get, man, uh, just 400 pages worth of stories. Uh, my favorite one in here is... Oh man, is it in the land of time? But essentially, this guy declares war on time and ends up uh, sieging the city and wasting away. Like, it's just the most bizarre, interesting story. Another great one kind of in this genre is The Worm o Ouroboros by... Let me see if I can find it real quickly. Probably not. Um, by E.R. Edison, uh, another really great old weird book uh, that takes place on another world that turns into a fantasy world. Um, both are weird and interesting, and I say weird in a very specific sense. They have a sense of otherness to them that is very vitally important, uh, and Dunsany and uh, Edison, I believe, well, I know Dunsany did. Dunsany inspired Tolkien, Clark Ashton Smith, H.P. Uh, Lovecraft. This is the guy who is at the deepest roots of modern fantasy, and it's a shame that more people don't know about him. Edison, I believe, inspired a lot of these people or was a contemporary of them. I could be wrong. If I'm wrong, let me know in the in the comments. So, other books that inspire me. If you followed our Fading Suns game, this was the basis for the Fading Suns game. Now, uh, Dante's Divine Comedy. Most people have read Inferno, which I think is sort of the weakest of the three, or at least the least interesting of the three for me. But tends to be the one that most people read. Also, don't get the one associated with the video game. I don't feel like they should get any money. Uh, that's my own personal opinion. If you're watching it and a fan of the video game, Let's chat in the comments. Um, so why is this interesting? Well, first off, fair word is an incredibly Catholic work. But it provides this unique look at like 
religious imagination and the way that poets will take the works of religion and faith and turn them into a narrative. And so if we're running our fantasy, if we're running Fading Suns or science fiction games, stuff like this should be happening in our worlds. And so what's interesting to me is this, the movement in Dante, the fact that things like tech, like, right, when we think about like Lord of the Rings, the Lord of the Rings movement or our D&D campaign movement or our game movements tend to be two-dimensional, right? We start in the Shire and we work our way to Rivendell. You know, it's the, the red dot on the map for Indiana Jones. Dante works in three dimensions, kind of going down and then back up, as well as spiraling around a mountain or spiraling around a pit. A lot, and I do mean a lot, of our modern interpretations of what heaven and hell look like they come from Dante and they come from Milton they don't necessarily come from like actual tradition but this is also if you're a fan of poetry some of Dante's stuff is just amazing if you're a fan of um 1300s Italy uh history there's a lot of snark in here if you know what you're looking for Dante Dante very clearly picks out his political targets (laughs) Right, depending, there was this big war uh, that was going on in the area, and um, you can tell Dante's political leanings in who ends up in heaven, who ends up in purgatory, and who ends up in hell. So that's another thing that I took away from this book that has nothing to do with uh, uh, religion. I mean, as we, as I've mentioned before, I've got a master's in theology, um, but the fact that poets. And we see it today in like even things as like recently as uh, music videos that people use their art as a way to take stabs or jibes or elevate people in the world. And so for Dante to do this with which was clearly a very Catholic work is interesting to me. In games, what are your bards doing? What are your bards singing about? What are the minstrels singing about? What are the poems and the songs that are being told? They're not just going to be legends and myths and stories of great battles. But the individual person's prejudices and the individual person's point of view is also going to come out in these stories. Uh, right? We have this idea of the jester being the person who can point out even the king's flaws. And so I think there's value in looking at this. All right, that's my old book stuff. A little bit more modern fantasy. Uh, Stephen R. Donaldson's Thomas Covenant Chronicles. I will be giving content warnings on some of these books. Um, If these things are troubling to you, do not go into them. Uh, Donaldson wrote a series based off of Wagner's Ring Cycle about a man in our world, a leper, uh, a man who has leprosy uh, in the modern world who is transported to this other reality. And for the, at least the first Chronicles, you're not sure if the reality is real or not, or if he's just having essentially a mental break. And he does something very horrific. It's not... Uh, I don't want to put this, because I don't want the algorithm to come at me. Um... It's not gratuitous, it's not glorified, it lasts less than half a page. But it's along the lines of some of the more um, more graphic and um, violent things that you would find in, say, Martin, Game of Thrones, that sort of thing. But where Martin will go on for pages is about half a page. And part of the struggle in the First Chronicles is Covenant both regretting what he did and trying to atone for it, But also, does it matter? Is this other world real? Is it worth defending? Is is the secondary world, does it have value? And that is super inspiring to me from a game design perspective. Because what are we doing when we're playing role-playing games? We're all stepping into a secondary world. And then Donaldson deals with other themes like, how do we confront evil? How do we confront depression and despair? Do we use power? Do we use armies? Do we meet evil on its own terms? And 
if we do that, what does that say about us? So, things to think about. The second and third chronicles drift a little bit away from that. Less psychological fantasy. In the first first three books, there's definitely this feeling of the things in the real world are affecting us in the secondary world. And let's be honest, sometimes gaming is therapy for us, whether we want it to be or not. Uh, sometimes the GM is bringing their issues into the game. Sometimes players are wrestling with their own issues. Sometimes we are dealing with friends who are going through a really tough time. Now, I'm a big fan of gaming as therapy. Uh, to quote Trevor Noah, I'm also a fan of therapy as therapy. Uh, but there's something in there about Donaldson, whereas Tolkien believed in the secondary world in its own inherent value. Donaldson looks at it as an externalization of internal conflict. And there are there's benefit to that. But again, much like when I was talking about Mage, there are, there are cautions there. Another book series, two series of books that have major content warnings uh, along the same lines, but are among my favorites. Gardens of the Moon. This is the first book by Steven Erickson in the Malazan, Books of the Fallen. Uh, and this series ends up taking a shelf and a half on my bookshelf. There are ten books in the main sequence. There are six books in the Malazan Empire series. There are like seven short stories. There is another trilogy. Uh, there are actually three other trilogies that are going on. It's this, But what's interesting to me about this, so this is military fantasy. It follows a very Romanesque empire. It follows multiple armies across multiple content, continents. The plot is so massive that four books in, it shifts. Book five is a completely different continent with a completely different cast of characters. And so your, each book is sort of self-contained, but it's bouncing back and forth. Uh, but it, very important... Uh, of a reread, like on the reread, it's even more important, or more. I think it's it's one of those series that's better on the reread. Uh, I will say, Gardens of the Moon is a tough book to get into. Um, Erickson has said that if he could go back and rewrite Gardens, he would, because he had like four thousand years of history, and where do you start the history of Rome? So he just picked a point and started. Gardens is solid. It makes sense from start to finish, but Erickson doesn't spoon-feed you. If two characters are talking about something that they both understand, they don't stop to explain it. It would be like if I looked at Rook and said, Hey, um, just got a new Tesla and love it. And Rook was like, Oh, that's awesome. I wouldn't stop to explain to Rook what a Tesla is. Rook wouldn't need that explanation. So you spend the first two books sort of picking up the world through osmosis, which is a great way of introducing your characters to a world. Um, another world that does, uh, another story that does this better is if you haven't seen it, go check out Arcane on Netflix. It's possibly the best world building I've seen in a television show, especially an animated television show in decades. You just, you pick up the world as you go through it. Uh, also, major themes of this book are about compassion. Um, why, what it means to be human and why compassion is, needs to be central to that definition. Something that comes up a lot in my games. Also, it kind of helped me understand that magic doesn't always have to be explained. Magic uh, can be mysterious. It can have rules rules can sometimes be contradictory, but it can have rules, but it doesn't need an explanation. I am far more on the Erickson Tolkien side of magic than I am on the Sanderson side of magic, where magic is a, a logic puzzle or uh, a smart person's dopamine fix. Uh, this is the series that comes with the highest content warning that I can give. Do not, if you are disturbed by, if you are disturbed by Martin, do not look at R. Scott Baker's The Darkness That Comes Before. Um, if you're not bothered by Martin, or if you feel like you can um, skip over those, those kind of scenes, you all know what the scenes I'm talking about. This is a look at, this is philosophical fantasy. Uh, the first trilogy is basically the first crusades. If you're a fan of history, it is the first crusades in a fantasy world. 
that is almost as real as Middle Earth. Like R. Scott Baker creates a secondary world that is amazing. What did I take from game design at this? Is that sometimes it is very necessary to fade to black. Safe, like you know, there's been a lot of discussions about safety tools in gaming recently. And I think there are ways to approach things at a game with a table with friends and still have things that you never bring up. Baker doesn't shy away from those. There's a need to pull back. Um, Baker does it for a very specific reason that he talks a lot about in his blog posts and his interviews. Uh, I won't get into that. So again, major content warning. Lots of graphic descriptions of violence of all kinds. But what I love about it is the philosophical heart of this. It wrestles with ideas that haven't gone away since Plato and Aristotle have written them down. What does it mean to be human? What is the nature of a soul? What would magic actually look like in a world? If you could actually charm person, what would that do to somebody? Uh, what's interesting about both Baker's world and Erickson's world is that they both started as role-playing campaigns. This is encouraging to me. Uh, Erickson and Esselmont, the two main writers for Malazan, this is their DM. This is their uh, their GURPS game. They li they they literally started with second or first edition, switched over to GURPS. You can tell as you're reading through the books what groups of characters were actually player characters in the game which is just fantastic and baker's world was the background for his D, &D game uh, it also kind of encourages you to ignore game balance for the sense of rule or for the sense of uh, verisimilitude mages in baker's world are obscenely powerful like even the basic most uh simplest trained mage is about as powerful as like a 15th or 16th level wizard. But because of the way the magic works, there are several magic items in the world, uh, a horde of items called Kore, that if they touch a mage, it turns them to, to salt. And if you're holding a Kore, you're completely immune to magic. How would you even balance that in a game world? Yet he did, and then he wrote the story about it. So if you like philosophy and you have a... Um, I want to say more resilient constitution because there's a lot of darkness in this book. The first book is called The Darkness That Comes Before. If darkness doesn't bother you, if you enjoy grimdark, something to, to look at. Um, and then kind of the last two that have really influenced my, my personal GMing style. This book is spectacular. Play Dirty by John Wick. And if you go to his, if you look up John Wick, game designer, not John Wick, you know, movie assassin... Uh, during the start of the pandemic, he actually read a chapter a day out of Play Dirty and then gave updated commentary. Uh, he's a d delightful person to listen to reading. You should totally uh, check it out. If you want to know why John Wick sounds familiar, John Wick was the lead story designer for the L5R card game. He was the lead game designer for the L5R role-playing game, Legend of the Five Rings. Uh, he was also the lead... Uh, Designer for both 7th C 1st Edition and 7th C 2nd Edition. He's done games like Orc World and Cats and 30, Houses of the Blooded. These are all games that he has really dug into, and they're, they're frankly spectacular. He has always been on kind of the bleeding edge of role-playing design, and this is a collection of how he chooses to run his games, or I should say a snapshot of how he chose to run his games. And then last but not least, there's this little book that just came out recently called Arbiter of Worlds. If you are an old school fan or want to get into the old school mentality, it is an interesting look at the GM as a facilitator of fun, not as a creator of fun. That essentially the GM's goal is to provide an environment where fun can be had. But it sort of helps remind you that you are not responsible for other people's feelings, and you are not responsible for other people's fun. Someone comes to the game and they've had a horrible day and they have zero fun at your table. That's awful, but that's not on you as the GM. So, whew, 22 minutes, half a cup of coffee down, and that's where we're going to 
leave off for the day. Uh, again, post comments in the chat on YouTube. I would love to chat with you about these books. If you hate them, some of these books I understand are a, either an acquired taste or are a massive turnoff to some people. And that is okay. We can disagree on that. Uh, I still appreciate your input. I appreciate you as a person. I hope after seeing this video, you feel the same way about me. Um, so yeah, let's uh, jump over to the YouTube uh, channel. Let's chat about this in the comments. Uh, if you like what we do, please consider uh, subscribing here on Twitch, following us here on Twitch, jumping over to the YouTube channel and doing the same. It helps uh, both platforms kind of point us uh, to other people who may enjoy these same kind of topics. So until Thursday, when we come back on Thursday, I will be talking about Chaosium Con. Uh, Evan and I uh, from Exploring Glorantha, we're going to be heading to Chaosium Con next week, and it should be a blast. We're going to try and play in some games, go to some seminars, and when we come back, I'm going to try and have Evan on behind the screen, and we're going to just do a debrief of how cool Chaosium Con was. Also this week on Sunday, or no, on Saturday morning, we will be doing the next episode of the Grand Campaign, episode three where we talk about systems and why systems matter in a grand campaign. So, uh, to everyone who is in chat, it is always good to see you. Sorry I was a little bit more focused on the books. And we'll be back on Thursday with this discussion about uh, Chaosium Con. And until next time, stay safe, stay healthy, stay gaming. And I'll see you on Thursday when we once again step behind the screen. Have a good one.